right, if you would make your way over there. And down to our last two classes. Next, next week is our last class. And, and I think we will finish right on schedule. Let me say a, a couple of things about chapter 7 so you'll have a little bit of a sense of where you're going. I think that, um, I think that 7 really has two main sections. We'll cover the first one tonight that uh, runs from to, down to verse 12. And I think that's, uh, that's really kind of wrapping up the message. I think that's the end of what has been uh, the primary point or core of the sermon. And then next Sunday night, we'll pick up in verse 13 and go through the end of the chapter. And I actually think all of that is conclusion or Jesus wrapping up the sermon and, and, and maybe conclusion in the best word, maybe call is the best word because after teaching all of this, now he's going to make a call to his audience and I just think he does that in some different ways. And so you might read that uh, for next week and be looking for that and, and thinking about that. Um, tonight, we'll look at these first 12 verses and uh, conclude the, the teaching segment of the sermon. Um, this, this segment has been difficult um, for those who try to structure the Sermon on the Mount. These next two pieces don't really seem to fit very well. Uh, in light of what he has been saying. By the way, let's just back up and refresh ourselves. What, what has Jesus been saying up to this point in the sermon? Don't let me down here. Yeah, so we've had that whole inside, outside thing going on. How far back does that go? Come on, don't let me down. Well, so that would be a chapter 5. Verse 20, where he says what? You can peek, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, so we've really been pressing that all the way through the last several weeks of class, that Jesus in chapter 5, verse 20 said, you need a greater righteousness than the righteousness of the Pharisees. And what we learned is that that does not mean you've got to check the boxes better, but that it isn't about checking boxes. Like Susan said, it's about, it's about having a heart devoted to Jesus. And if you're genuinely devoted to Jesus, what happens to the boxes? They get checked. That's exactly right. In fact, in fact, in fact you're better about obedience and you, you don't wind up with some of the wackiness the Pharisees wound up with because they only worried about what they looked like on the outside and not where their hearts were on the inside. And so the question people struggle with is, how does the beginning of seven fit with that and we'll dig into it here in a little bit and, and and see if we can figure out why that's a struggle for some folks uh, let me give you a little a little structure to ponder as we go through this uh, I think that that there are two segments to this early piece maybe three uh, verses one through six how about if we call that judging does that work for you since Troy has already already kind of given away the game tonight, right? And, and, and said, don't judge me when he came into class. And then in verses uh, 7 through 11, uh, he talks about asking. And notice I left one out, right? What's verse 12? My favorite. Your, your favorite? Okay. I learned something about my wife tonight. I did not know that, that, that Matthew 7, 12 uh, was your favorite verse. Um, and we'll mess with that one because I have some curiosities about, about what Jesus wanted us to do with uh, verse 12. And when we get to the end of the night, uh, tonight, we'll work on that a little bit before, before we run out of time. So I want to read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 7. And I'm going to give you an assignment as listeners. You can follow on your Bible or just sit back and listen to me. I want you to ponder how this segment about judging would tie back to everything we've been talking about since chapter 5 and verse 20. Or, or is it supposed to tie back there? Some people actually think that, 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 that Matthew's just dropping stuff in here. Remember, this is, a, this is a, a sample sermon of what the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom sounded like. And some people are like, oh, no, he's just throwing that in. And I think, uh, I think it's giving up too quickly to say that. So... Uh, since I'm making such a big deal about, you know, now I think there's a connection, right? 
So let's see if we can find it together. This is chapter 7, verse 1. Maybe in our generation, the most well-known verse in the whole Bible, right? Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not look at the log that is in your own eye. How can, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. There's our word again, by the way. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and tear you to pieces. So, you see any connection between that and what he's been saying up to now? Yeah, oh, oh, and jumping right in. It gives me hope that we're going we're gonna to work this out. Please. So this whole business about judging does kind of wind up being a heart issue. And there's one word he uses there that I think is a clue that he's talking about a heart issue. What is it? Yeah. Remember back in chapter 6, don't do your religious service like, like a hypocrite, right? Where you're just putting on the outward show and, and inwardly are corrupt. Yes. Or, or trying to oppress others. Actually, so what's really funny about those two answers is that I had two things written down in my notes about this. Uh, one possibility is that Jesus has just given us another category. Uh, because remember, he's, he's already talked about lust and vows and prayers and fasting and, and, and material stuff and worry and all that stuff. And now we're just getting something else. We're getting, we're getting some stuff about judging. And, and, and don't, don't be a hypocrite that's pointing the, the finger at everybody else. Why, inwardly, you're not who you ought to be. There is sort of an, an inside-outside thing going on there where you're pointing out everybody else's mistakes while inwardly you are, are still corrupted. So maybe, maybe that is the point. But you added something different to this. And I wonder, too, if it isn't possible that Jesus gives us this segment at the beginning of seven as, as a warning that befalls people pursuing the greater righteousness. So what happens when you know things that other people don't know? Yeah, this higher righteousness, oddly enough, might put us in danger of being self righteous right to look down on others and to be judgmental of them and so and so we wind up uh, we wind up with this big arrogant log in our eye while we're trying to tell everybody else what they're doing wrong and how they need to do better and so in response to that maybe it's both of those things but in response to that Jesus admonition chapter 7 verse 1 is do not judge now Let's talk about that. Verse 1 gets mis misused a lot in our culture, yes? Y'all buy that? Tell me about it. How is it misused? So you can't judge people. It's a law. You can't judge me. Some people say that Jesus is arguing that disciples... And, and let's, let's be specific about what people mean when they say that. Disciples can never look at someone else's conduct and consider it wrong or worse yet tell them their conduct is wrong right that's typically and, and that's usually got to do with morality in our culture very common among for example the homosexual community and the transgender community for people to say you have no right to judge my life because see Jesus said Jesus said do not judge so we hear that a lot and so I would suggest working this passage tonight is really important. Let's be sure we go away with clarity about it because we're going to talk to people about it. So, so I describe that as a misuse. Why is it a misuse? Context. 
meaning. Where are you going with that? Because I can go a couple of places. I need to know where yours is. So, so I'm glad you said that because there are actually several contextual problems. One of the problems there is it seems pretty clear that Jesus right here when he's talking about this is going to tell us later on to judge, right? Because when he's doing the whole beam and speck thing, notice in verse 5 he says, first take the log out of your own eye. Why? So this passage isn't teaching that I'm not supposed to mess with Rick's specs. In fact, is it teaching the opposite? I am supposed to mess with Rick's spec. He's just saying, don't do it with a big log in your eye, right? So yeah, that's one contextual problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll say more about that. Let me... Yeah, let me come back to that. I'm, 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 I'm going to say more about that. that. That's a little ahead, so hold that thought. Yeah. Well, in this verse, too, so when you're judged, when you, when you judge, you're going to be judged. You realize that. In the same way that you judge, you're going to be judged. So be righteous. Which also would seem really to imply that there is going, that it isn't about judging, but about the manner of judging. Yeah, I think verse 2 is... Okay, so that's why I asked Mark what he had in mind because actually if you keep working through the sermon, the problem doesn't get better because in verse 6 he says, uh, don't give what is holy to the dogs. Because uh, he isn't talking about dogs, right? Uh, as much as I would be happy a scripture take dog, uh, trash dogs, sorry dog people, I know. But you know, dogs are bad in the Bible, right? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Um, man, we're going to get posts about this on Facebook. Okay, so so no, you're exactly right. He, he's not talking about dogs. What is he talking about in verse 6? People that aren't worthy of People that are dogs. Come on, you can say it like it is. He, he, he's, 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 he's calling people dogs and, 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 and pigs. Yeah, we, we wouldn't want to judge tonight, right? But, uh, but, but he's saying you actually have to be able to, uh, as you think about where you're going to plant your seed, uh, who's, who's a dog and a, and a pig and who isn't? That's literally what he's saying. Who is undeserving of your effort? We'll talk more about verse 6 in a minute and try to clarify some of that. But you've got to make a judgment to do that. But we're still not done. Run your eyes down to verse 15. What does that say? Beware of false Prophets. What does beware mean? Be on your guard. You've got to be sensitive to the danger of being led astray by the wrong voice, which would require you to do what? Yeah, I've got to listen to a message and draw a conclusion. The message is right or the message is wrong. And, 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 and so based on that, whose voice will I hear and whose voice will I not hear? That requires making judgment. And, and, and look, look, and, and, just, and just on and on and on and on this could go. I mean, judgments, judgments have to be made. In fact, that's one of my problems with this is, is, is logically the argument it's wrong to judge is unsound. Someone says to you, Susan, it's wrong for you to judge me. Anybody see the logical problem with that? Thank you for laughing, because it is funny. Yeah, if you're judging, you're judging. Yes, yes, they're judging me as a judger. <laughs> so, so the correct response to that is, then stop it. No, don't do that. That, would, that wouldn't be funny. But, but you see the point, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a self-defeating argument, which means logically it is unsound, it doesn't work. And so to treat this text as though Jesus is saying you should never hear someone look at their conduct and reach a conclusion about it's being right or wrong and saying something to them is just absolutely untrue. Yes, Rick? Many, many scriptures say what is right and wrong. Jesus is implying to the devil when he was suggesting the devil suggested to him to do something he said it is written. So we go back to what is written. I think part of this here is going beyond what is written. So it's my, is it my personal judgment or is it God's judgment? God's judgment, it's damned. Yeah. It's my personal judgment, and, and maybe I don't even have the facts to make the judgment. It doesn't stand. I, I, 
as an aside, just because it's a fitting place to do that, to do this, because we're really good at spotting other people's cherry picking, because that's what this is. This is grabbing a phrase that serves a purpose for me and, and not doing with it what the Holy Spirit is intended. It is not just our religious friends or, or our, our, our friends of the world who are defending homosexuality who do that with the Bible. We do too. And, and so there's a cautionary note here about the importance of context, uh, reading around a statement or a verse, at least looking at the paragraph or, or the chapter to be sure that what we're doing is consistent with the intent of the Holy Spirit who put this down. I just think that's really, really important because this is a great example how people fall into that, into that trap. Let's go back to this text because what we need to know is, we know what it's not teaching. Let me ask you, what is Jesus trying to say? Yes. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a commentary on be careful of your blind spots. So let me write that down. Be careful about our judging. I think if you know, it's like if your heart is right, when you see somebody else have an issue that they're oblivious to, I think a healthy reaction to that is, oh no, do I do that too? And where do I do that? Looking at instead of focusing on, you know, their issue, I think a healthy thing is to turn it around and go, oh, maybe I do that. Mm, yeah. And where, oh. where do I do that? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Sometime in the last 50 years, I heard of something that just fits with this. A Christian saw another Christian going into a bar. You may have heard it when you were little. It was at Spring Branch. <laughs> I was probably sleeping. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, he complained to the elders. And the elders told him, well, he is a process thing. <laughs> <laughs> context, yeah. context is helpful, huh? huh? Context is helpful. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, I, I think here we'll I'll, I'll try to shout at you. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else, what do you think he's saying here? Judge not, that you be not judged. I think today in church, it's just easy. Like, what you said, it's got to be just from God's heart. It's got to be from God's judgment. So, don't shoot me, I'm the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> Needs to be about God's will. Okay? Anybody else, what do you think? What does he say? I, I, I think, oddly enough, uh, the reason that statement's often misunderstood is because we use the period at the end of verse 1 to stop us. And I think verse 2 is critical in this. Listen to what he says. For in the way you judge... You will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And so I read verse 2, and my brain almost immediately says, wait, I missed verse 1. Because he goes from saying, don't judge, to doing what in verse 2? Telling us how to judge. In fact... I want you to see if you can't find a literary connection or a thematic connection between verse 2 and verse 12. The more I thought about verse 2, I began to see verse 12. Do you see it? What is it? However you judge people, you want to be merciful to them. Because you want to do also others. However you want people to treat you. So however you want people to judge you, you should. Yes. Doesn't verse 2 sound like that? Beware that 
the judgment you give is the judgment you're going to get. And I thought it was interesting that actually the guys who write about this text are split on whether that means people will treat you the way you treat them or whether God's going to treat you the way you treat other people. And I think it works either way. I'll leave it to your judgment to figure that out. But I think that's exactly what the Lord is saying here. I don't think he's saying don't pass judgment. I think it's just the opposite. I think he's saying be fair with your judgment. When you have to pass judgment of other people, you treat them like you would want to be treated. So here's my question to you. How do you want to be judged by others? Well, okay, yeah, but let's quantify that a bit. What does that look like? might still be like the teenage boy in me. Wait, wait, wait. How old are you? Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I found that in the park. I found that out in the parking lot uh, Wednesday night. Yeah, anyway. Right. Uh, but like, it's almost like I, I don't really want to judge anyone. Interesting. Because, well, then that's pretty low bar. <laughs> I, I, I actually... Though, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on that. I'm gonna throw a word up here, and you can argue with me, or I can just hijack your point. It works either way for me. I think there should be a reluctance in us about passing judgment on other people. In other words, that would be the sort of the balance side to the person that's always going around looking at everybody else, saying, "Oh, what's wrong with you?" I picked on you because you're the safest person in the class for me to do that too. You see? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so, I mean, you're just hitting a lot of different points, Robert, that need, that need to, yeah, let me come back to that. Um, I want people to give me the benefit of the doubt. And by that, I mean, if there is a good way to understand my behavior, I want you to assume that about me. In fact, I would be offended and hurt if one of you guys who know me saw something and chose to think the very worst of it rather than the very best. I think, come on, Earl, you sold me a house, dude. How much time did we spend together? Do you not know me? Give me the benefit of the doubt. Don't you want others to do that for you? Heard a great story about that. Um, have you all read The Seven Habits? Yeah. Right? Okay. What's that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's Stephen Covey wrote the book. And he talks about being on this train. And um, there's a guy on the train with a bunch of kids. Y'all know the story? Oh, yeah. It's a great story. And the kids are just terrible. I mean, they're just running around, being noisy, bumping into old people, doing all the wrong things. And Covey said, I'm sitting there watching this thinking, dude, why isn't the dad doing something? He's just kind of sitting there with his head down while his kids are being monsters. And so Covey does what my mother would have done, right? Okay? Yeah. I, I love all the people shaking their head that know my mom because you know. Covey goes over, and he sits next to the guy, and he's nice about it, but he says, you know, your children are, are misbehaving and, and bumping into people and making noise. and They're, they're out of control, sir. You need to do something. So the guy kind of picked his head up and looked around and he said, oh, I'm really sorry about that. You know, we've just come from the hospital. Their mother just died and they don't know. And I haven't been thinking about anything except how do I tell my children their mother's dead? And in the book, Covey called that a paradigm shift, right? He goes from thinking, what a rotten dad to oh, how much mercy and grace does this guy need in this moment, right? So I think that's exactly it. Stott, in his excellent book on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Christian Counterculture, 
commented on this text and he said, the commandment is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea to be generous. And I think that is the point. I think that is what he's saying here. We should judge the way we want to be judged. Makes sense. And I got to tell you, the more you dig into that, the harder it gets, right? That's not an easy thing to do. So let's press on because in 3, 4, and 5, he brings up this, uh, this speck and beam stuff. And we haven't said anything about that. What are, what are we to do with this, this speck and beam stuff? Yeah. On yourself first. Yes, ma'am. I think um, we have to look at our motivation for why we're judging. And I think if you are truly looking at something in somebody's life and you love them and you want what's best for them and you want them to go to heaven, you're going to approach that with a certain way. But in able to, to be able to do that, you have to be effective. And the only way to do that is to make sure you're seeing clearly. And then what is your motivation for going through them? And how are you going to do that? How are you, how's that motivation going to help you clear that? And it says clearing it. You're going to remove it. You're going to help them. Right. You're not just going to point it out. You're going to help remove it. So let me ask you a question about that. If I'm going to help someone with any task, what does that typically require? That I know something about the task. Um, I've had some guy come help me build stuff in the garage, and uh, when they grabbed their first power tool, I immediately knew they didn't know anything about the task, right? And so what you do is say, you know, we're not letting you operate the hammer drill today. We're going to put that down over here and maybe give you a screwdriver to turn or something, right? Because, because they're not qualified. They don't have the skill to do the task, right? I think that is exactly what's going on here. I think Jesus is actually saying there are some people not qualified to pass judgment. Who is it? Sorry? The, the guy that's got a big log sticking out of his eye does not need to be performing eye surgery. In our setting, what is that? What's the parallel that he's trying to make with us? I, that's, the, that's the figure he uses, the beam and the speck, but it reflects on what? What does it symbolize? Sin. So, ooh. Now we're going to get into trouble because we're going to have big sins and small sins, right? Logs and specks. But is that true? I mean, not in the sense of consequence, but, but there are sometimes rather glaring, obvious violations of the law of God, and then there's other more minor tweaks to behavior we do all throughout life. I think that's the difference between the beam and the speck and what's the Lord saying about that? I think, I think the person who has their own glaring, obvious spiritual failure that they are not addressing is not qualified to be trying to help other people with their spec. Now, now, now I don't, I'm not saying you can't love somebody and care about them, but if you do not know how to get the beam out, finish that sentence. What are you going to offer to help with the spec, right? You see what I'm saying? I think that's the point uh, that the Lord is trying to address here. And by the way, I do think this happens all the time. I think sometimes when we got big hidden sin in our life, what do we tend to do to others? We tend to nitpick every little thing we see wrong in their life. And I think what Jesus is saying is, listen, you don't know how to fix other people. You haven't figured out how to fix yourself yet. And so I think that introspection, that introspection is 
important. If I've got a glaring spiritual fail failure, by the way, this is biblical. In Galatians 6, who is qualified to restore the erring brother? Galatians 6, 1. You who are spiritual restore such a one. And so the ideal is there biblically that there are people qualified and there are people who are not qualified. And I think what he's saying to us here, hey, first figure out, figure out how to get that big log sticking in your eye. Figure out how to deal the glaring spiritual failure you have in your life. And maybe you will, when you finish with that, be equipped to help other people do the same. You buy that? Yes, ma'am. Now, now, I wonder if people will hear that and they will think, okay, so that means we have to be perfect before we can help anybody else? Fix that. Okay. Okay. why I listen to Dave Ramsey when he gives advice on finances. Anybody know Dave Ramsey's backstory? Bankrupt what is it? Twice. Yes, big bankrupt, like like million dollar big big time bankruptcies. Uh, but I think he's figured that out. If you know anything about where he is today, he's figured that out. So I'm thinking, hmm, I'm actually even more impressed listening to a guy who's been on top and then crashed and burned and found his way back. I think maybe he has something to help me along the way, financially. See what I'm saying? So I've got to have the skill learned in dealing with my own life of removing the logs before I could start doing eye surgery on someone else. Anybody want to comment on that? I hope that helps us with that text because we're going to have to talk to people about it a lot. Now, then we get to verse 6. Does anybody get to verse 6 and you think, why is this verse here? Right? Does it strike you as weird? Because it does me. We've just been talking about judging. And, uh, and by the way, how important is that after giving us this whole lengthy sermon about this higher righteousness that we're achieving for, hey, as you're striving for that, careful about being judgmental of other people. But then this in verse 6, do not give what is unholy to the dogs, not throw your pearls before swine. So, so f fix that for me. Why is that there? It is judge. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? I, I think that Robert is correct, that what we have here now is balance on the other side because he has just told us at some length, be generous when you judge other people. Be merciful. Treat them the way you would want to be treated. That's one side of this, right? But the flip side is that not all players are good players. Some people are rightly judged as wicked because they are wicked. And so while on the one hand he says, don't judge harshly, on the other side of that he says, don't be naive, right? You see it? Can we be that way too? I know it's not the 
There's a difference between being gracious and generous and being gullible mm -hmm. and naive. Different. And And, and particularly in this context when he has just talked to us about trying to help other people spiritually. And, and this to me, this is, this is just a painful hard reality about evangelism, okay? That sometimes we're talking to people who are, who are gonna be eager to love the Lord, right? Eager to serve the Lord. We talk to people like that, Pam, right? And then sometimes we talk to people who are closed and are wicked and don't want to change their ways. And what does he say about that in verse 6? If you're talking to someone who is wicked and closed and not interested in changing their ways. Yes. By the way, who else did that? Jesus did that. The disciples were told, dust off your feet, go to the next town, and boy, they're going to be in trouble when God comes, right? The Lord taught that. And so if the Lord acknowledged there's a time to move on, there is a time to move on. Not everybody is a good prospect for the gospel. And with the limited resources and time we have, we need to make sure that we invest in the most fertile soil, right? Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Who said that? Jesus did. John, in Matthew 10, when he sent out his disciples. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So here you go. Here's the balance. Hey, don't be unkind and, and harsh in your judgment of people. Be generous and merciful. On the flip side of that, some guys are bad players, right? You need to not waste your time planting your seed there. All right. Any questions about one through six? So I'm going to move on. 7 through 11. Maybe we could have just sang the song with this. We could have just had Troy lead us in this. It would have been more fun to sing it, though. It leaves off all the fish and stone stuff, so I guess we couldn't do that. Verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and who seeks finds. And to him and knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you? Who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he will not give him a snake? Will he? If you then, being evil, know how to good, good, good gifts to your children or grandchildren, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So my question to you, again, is the same. Why is this here? How does it fit what we've been working on since 520, this higher righteousness? Yeah, I know, but all, but all, I know, but all that, st all that stuff about material stuff is in between. It would be out of place. I am, I am hopelessly striving for structure. It just has to yeah, I know, I know. I sometimes wonder if the Holy Spirit is saying, get over it, David. I didn't put any structure there. Just move on. How does this fit at this point in the sermon? Any ideas? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it does. Other thoughts about that? Hmm. Tell me some more about that. I want to know more what your thinking is on that. It's an incredible promise. Yeah. Job is, is to ask and to 
So let me ask y'all a question. Why would we need to hear that at this point in the sermon? By the way, has there been anything hard before that? Anything, anything in the, it's from, from 520 up until 7, 6. Have you had anything that you thought, ooh, that's hard? <laughs> yeah, let's identify which part was not hard, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, how 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 much of that? How about how about just what we said would you judge other people be as gracious and merciful as you would want to receive? How about the part about loving your enemies? How about everything at the end of of chapter 5 about hey, not only do I not want you killing people, I don't even want you thinking about about them in your heart. Let go of those bitter grudges. Every bit of this is hard. And I just can't help but wonder if by the time the Lord gets to the point, people are hearing this and saying, how do we do this? In fact, there are some people who have argued that the ethic of the Sermon on the Mount is so incredibly difficult that it is unattainable and unrealistic. There are people who trash the sermon and say, nobody can live like that. And question, are they right? Yeah, they are right. It's intimidating. It is. And so what does the Lord say here as his last point, if we're correct about the structure, and is about to close this out with this call to action before he does that, after giving us all this hard stuff, what does he say to us? How do we do it? How do we do it? We ask for help. That is exactly right. We ask him for help. It's right. We can't do this by ourselves. And he said, I'm not asking you to. I am here for you. In fact, what are his illustrations after giving us the ask and seek instruction? What would you do for your kids? What wouldn't you do for your children, right? Right? And I'm not talking about begging for another toy. Your kids legitimately needed your help. Where's your phone? If it was a text, oh, I got grandbaby pictures. I'll be distracted the rest of this session. <laughs> if it was a text from your kid, Dad, I need you now. What happens right now? You guys are leaving the classroom. You're leaving your offering here before the altar. You're going. What can I do for my children? What's the point? God says, if you imperfect people do that for your kids, it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. How much more will your father supply what you need? It's the perfect thing to be saying right here. It's exactly what I need. Yeah, I know I've called you to a really, really high standard of righteousness, but don't sweat it. I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to help you get through this. So what's the takeaway from that for me and you? I mean, practically speaking, what should we be doing? Yeah, we need a class on that, don't we? We just should have really dwelt on the need to be talking to the Father, a rich and meaningful habit of prayer. That includes asking. I think we pray about a lot of stuff. I just think so often our stuff that we pray for uh, relates to the stuff that he kind of trashed literally at the end of Matthew 6, right? And what we need to be praying for is help me to be on the inside, this person you called me to be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know that we plead enough that God would make us a more forgiving person. Let me, let me get rid of this bitterness that's in my heart, right? And let me, let, me, let me find a way, show me how to be kind 
to my enemies. Help me. When's the last time we said this one? Help me care less about my stuff. Help me want less earthly treasure and heavenly treasure. Help me judge people more kindly. I don't think we pray like that. And I think that's exactly the kind of prayer he's talking about here. You're going to sing the song differently now, right? Because it's a whole different idea than what I typically think is on our hearts. We pray that. Want to weigh in on that? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so you have not reached your limit yet, okay? I'll let you know. You're still, you're still good. Blind spots. Yeah. I think that's already been said tonight. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Let's talk about verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And again, I read that and I think, why is this here? I know it's a golden rule, maybe one of the most familiar verses in the whole Bible for a lot of people. But remember that it isn't randomly, well, I don't believe it's randomly dropped there. I don't think Holy Spirit was saying, hey, you know that stuff about the golden rule? We need to throw that in somewhere as we talk about the uh, what the, the preaching of the kingdom looked like. I, <sighs> okay. So this is my struggle with verse 12. Verse 12 certainly bookends nicely the beginning of this segment where he talked about judgment. You know, you're going to get the kind of judgment you give. So, so think about how you want to be treated. And this, is, this sort of broadens that out a little bit. Well, let me ask you a question. Should we limit it to verse 12? I mean, to, to this segment? You want to go all the way back to 20? Why? So, so when I read that, I start wondering, well, it certainly is a great sort of ending statement for what he has said about judgment. But I start looking back up in this sermon, and I'm thinking, there's some other stuff where this principle applies. Can you find other places going back beyond chapter 7 where this idea of treated the others the way you want to be treated treated would apply yes. So six twelve forgiveness and I, and I think that's this way about judging and it's the same thing. So how do you want God to treat you? And it's it's not like God's not going to judge and God's going to give us forgiveness for everything if we forgive everybody of everything. But it, it, it is we will be held to a higher standard if we can't forgive others. That's a roadblock. Yeah. And God tells us that. If right. We, if we can't hold back. Yeah, I think that's right. You see any other places where this principle might go back and overshadow that too? <sighs> don't hang, don't hang on to the bitter stuff. That's exactly right. There is a principle about lust. That's that's that has that same. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? How do you want your enemies to treat you? I definitely don't want the people around me to drive like I drive, right? Because we would all kill each other. You did not need to laugh at that, Carla. That was not that funny, right? So here's what I wonder. I wonder if verse 12 doesn't just look back on the whole thing and give us this easy, this easy principle for implementing the challenging things he's told us. I think that what he's saying is, hey, you know how to make this real easy? Just treat others the way you want to be treated, right? 
It's kind of like one of the other really easy principles that I love in Scripture that make application easy is Jesus says, do what I would do. And somehow that cuts through all the justifications that we hunt for and all the ways we try to, uh, to, 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 to write off our bad behavior. And it says, yeah, but would Jesus do that? And man, doesn't that just kind of clear the air? Now I know obviously what I need to do. And I think that's what he's saying here. I think you want to make this real easy? You just treat people like you want to be treated. That's really what this is about. Exactly. Actually, that's, I hadn't thought about that, but if y'all, let me see, let me make sure I got the right thing going on here. Where does it say, uh, for this is the law and the prophets? Yeah, I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of a different place. I have to go back and find it. Again. I'm sorry, they messed me up. They got my brain stirring about something. But, but, but I do think that it is the way that we apply the tough things we've learned. You want to make this real simple? Treat other people the way you want to be treated. All right, so think, uh, pick up at 13 in your reading this week, and let's just think about um, what the Lord tells us here, uh, tells his audience that's going to kind of wrap this up. How is he concluding the sermon? I think there's a great call here. See if you can find it. And we'll talk about it next Sunday. Last class. Thank you.